Okay, so now we're going to talk about thermogenesis and hypothermia in the newborn. Um, if a newborn is hypothermic, that increases their oxygen and metabolic needs. Now, every newborn is going from nice warm body temperature environment out into an environment that's around 70 degrees, and it's also they're also wet. So they all lose heat at birth immediately. One of our major jobs at birth is to is to minimize that heat loss. We need to maintain um, the infant's body temperature above 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And the way that we do that is through um, a neutral thermal environment. There are several things that cause heat loss. They have a change in their, temp in their ambient temperature. They have wet skin. Uh, newborn skin is thin. Um, they have subcutaneous fat that is there to help um, maintain body heat. But if they haven't had a chance to create enough subcutaneous fat, so think about those babies who are preterm or who are um, <clears throat> small because of intrauterine growth restriction. They don't have as much subcutaneous fat, so that can be a factor. Um, newborns also have a large body surface area in relation to their body mass and they have a large head and so they can lose heat, heat very quickly. There are four mechanisms of heat loss and you need to know these, okay? Convection is losing heat from the body surface to the air. How do we prevent that? Put a layer of clothes on the baby, put a hat on their head, okay? Don't have a fan blowing directly over them. Radiation is from the body surface to an object or surface that's nearby but not touching. So concrete walls, we know, tend to be cold. They tend to be um, to hold, to uh, not hold heat. So if I have the baby's uh, bassinet parked right next to this concrete wall, the baby can actually lose heat to that cold wall. Okay, that's radiation. Evaporation is vaporization of moisture. So we want to dry, get that baby dry immediately. And conduction is the body surface to, to something that's directly touching it. That can even be a cold stethoscope, okay? So um, know how to, know what all of those mean and how to, to address them because we have to address all of those. Um, how do infants make heat or maintain heat? First of all, they maintain heat um, by being flexed, okay? They're all wadded up, knees flexed, hips flexed, elbows uh, flexed. That helps maintain their body heat. So if they are floppy, which they might be, if they have... Um, um, hypoxia or they're sedated, that it's harder for them to maintain body heat. Um, increased muscle activity makes body heat. Um, infants are unable or newborns are unable to shiver effectively. They can't shiver for a few months. If a newborn is shivering, their metabolic rate has doubled. So shivering is, is um, not helpful and it's actually a sign that we really need to do a better job maintaining that baby's heat. Um, they also, one of the primary ways that they create heat in those first few minutes of life to try to maintain um, adequate body temperature is metabolizing the brown fat. Remember that in the last few months of pregnancy, subcutaneous fat is produced or is built up, which provides insulation to help maintain body temperature, but also brown fat. And the brown fat is metabolized right after birth to actually make heat. Um, one thing that you should know, we used to commonly give meperidine um, or Demerol uh, in labor and it blocks the metabolism of brown fat. Now it's not given as commonly, but if the patient has had meperidine, be aware that that infant may have a harder time they may not be able to metabolize the brown fat and may have a harder time maintaining their body temperature. So what happens if an infant, if a newborn has cold stress, they don't, they're kept, um, we're not maintaining their body temperature adequately. The respiratory rate increases, their, their oxygen consumption and energy increase. That actually diverts oxygen and energy from other needs. So if they have respiratory distress, and they're cold, we're making their respiratory distress worse. 
um, that can potentially reopen the ductus arteriosus. Um, it requires more energy at a time when their glucose source, the placenta, has been cut off. And so if they're already hypoglycemic and we're making them work harder to stay warm, they're going to get more hypoglycemic. So it can lead to hypoglycemia. Um, anaerobic glycolysis to handle that energy need causes acidosis, which can and it can actually displace bilirubin from the binding sites and make their jaundice worse later on. And increased glucose use may make them hypoglycemic or make it worse. So we really, it is really important in the care of a newborn and in particular the care of an at-risk newborn, it's really important to maintain their body temperature um, because if not, we put them at risk for um, hypoglycemia, uh, respiratory distress and respiratory and metabolic acidosis. Hyperthermia is pretty rare for infants. It would be a temperature greater than 99.5. The most common causes are inappropriate use of warmers, phototherapy, that's for um, using the ultraviolet light therapy for um, jaundice, sunlight, the room temperature being too warm and overdressing. A baby in the um, Warmer should have nothing on but a diaper, a baby in the phototherapy um, or under phototherapy should have nothing on but a diaper and eye protection. Um, and then we want to teach families not to overdress the baby. The baby should be covered and probably have one layer more than an adult would be comfortable in, but we don't want to have them. I've seen babies in um, onesie, sleeper, um, sometimes pants and a sweater over that, blanket over the top of the carrier in August in Dallas, okay? That baby is going to be hyperthermic. Um, if a baby's temperature is too high, their skin vessels dilate, they'll extend their posture, kind of lay out to try to let more heat radiate off of them. They're unable to sweat effectively. And again, if their temperature is too high, then that increases their metabolic and oxygen needs. So again, we're making them work too hard. Okay, next section is going to be about renal and gastrointestinal systems.